Hello and welcome to episode four of Unpacking Articles. My name is Florencia Henshaw. I have a PhD in second language acquisition from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And the author of today's article was in my dissertation committee. And that is the great Charlene Polio, an expert in second language writing. And the article we're going to be unpacking today is The Relevance of Second Language Acquisition Theory to the Written Error Correction Debate. And essentially what Polio is doing in this article is helping us answer the question that we've all asked ourselves at some point. Is correcting errors worth our time? So what's this debate that she alludes to in the title of her article? Well, on the one hand, we have Trascott saying things like grammar correction has no place in writing courses and should be abandoned. And on the other hand, we have Dana Ferris saying that effective error correction, that which is selective, prioritized, and clear, can and does help at least some student writers. So one side states that we should not correct errors because that doesn't have much of an effect on development and also it could be harmful because it inhibits students from taking risks. The other side says that correcting errors could actually be useful for the learners. True, not for everybody, but at least for some learners. And so what do we do? Do we correct? Do we not correct? Is it useful or is it not? Well, we first need to define useful or effective for what? If we're talking about immediate corrections, you correct um, a learner's essay and they're supposed to edit it and turn it back in, sure, it could be effective for that. But most teachers are thinking of effectiveness in terms of helping learners write more accurately down the line, subsequent writing assignments, or in a broader sense, language development or acquisition. That is really the big question here. Is it worth it long term? And different theories, different approaches to second language acquisition will have slightly different answers to that question. Polio presents a very nice summary of different theories and their views on the role of feedback and the role of explicit knowledge. I am going to simplify a lot and offer my interpretation of her summary. And essentially is these three camps, if you will. So the first one, generative processability theory, they view language acquisition as implicit. And so they view instructional interventions, such as corrective feedback, to have a very limited or no role in acquisition. And then you have skill-based or skill acquisition theory that I separated from the other two camps because unlike the other two camps, skill-based stems from the premise that learning a language is the same as learning anything else. And as we explored in other videos, not everyone agrees with that. For skill-based approaches, explicit knowledge, knowledge of rules, is important in language development, and therefore so is feedback or error correction. And then you have usage-based sociocultural interactionist approaches, and for this camp, focus on form, which we explored in another video, is facilitative of acquisition. They agree with the first camp that is mostly implicit, but they think that drawing the learner's attention to form, and feedback would be a way to do that, could help them build a linguistic system. So it could help them make the right form meaning connections. And so it all really boils down to the role of explicit knowledge and how these different theories view it differently. However, Polio finds the common ground among these different theories. 
So explicit knowledge is this conscious knowledge about the language. And we can all probably agree that error correction contributes to explicit knowledge. Another thing that we can all probably agree with is that explicit knowledge can help learners in terms of monitoring production. For example, self-correction, self-editing. And Polio makes it a point to highlight that even Krashen, who took an extreme position on the role of explicit knowledge in second language acquisition, pointed out that in writing, writers had time to monitor and apply knowledge from learned rules. And what Polio is suggesting is that error correction could help learners in terms of these learned rules, and therefore it could help them when it comes to monitoring their production. And it all sounds great, but here's the fine print. We have not sorted out what explicit knowledge students can and cannot apply, and all teachers know that students do not apply all of their explicit knowledge when writing or editing. In other words, it is not as straightforward as it sounds. Just because you know the rule does not mean you can apply it or even use it for editing. And so Polio concludes that all feedback is not useless or harmful, as Truscott said, but certain conditions need to be met for feedback to be effective. And even then, we have to remember that nothing guarantees that feedback will be effective. The first condition is that learners need to pay attention to the feedback, which makes sense. If the learners don't even see your feedback or don't even interpret your feedback as a correction, then of course feedback is not going to have any effect. And the second condition is that the feedback needs to have some sort of immediate purpose or application. It cannot just be the learners looking at the feedback or acknowledging that they received it and then they don't do anything with it. If there is no immediate purpose or application for the feedback, then it may not be worth your time to be giving them corrective feedback. And the third condition, which is definitely the hardest one to overcome in the classroom, is that the feedback needs to be at the right level for each and every student. And while this makes sense in theory, it is impossible for teachers to know what each and every learner is ready to acquire. And so for me, the takeaway is number one, curb your expectations in terms of the effects that you think feedback will have. And the second one is to reflect on what would you consider evidence of feedback being effective? As for whether it's worth your time or not, well, in part that depends on whether you can meet some of the conditions that Polio outlined in her article. At the very least, making sure that the students are paying attention to the feedback and that they're using it for something. But even when the conditions are met, feedback might not have a direct, immediate effect on language development. And that's why I think it's important to curb your expectations and also to think about what it means for feedback to be effective. That's just my take on it. As usual, I encourage you to read the article for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Thank you for tuning in and until next time.